Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and thank you for joining us here at Read Smart, the official podcast for the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction. I'm Shahid Abari and your host, and today we've got a totally fascinating and timely discussion lined up for you. Each year, the Bailey Gifford Prize is awarded to the best non-fiction book with nominees ranging across different genres, from history and nature writing to sport, politics and music. We're immensely grateful to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this podcast. Today we'll be thinking about how books and publishing have reacted in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis in 2020. And it's a complex set of questions that we're exploring. Is it even possible to write about the experience of race and racial discrimination? Or do writers, thinkers and academics of colour have a responsibility to record their lived experience? I'm joined by Olivette Otelli, Distinguished Professor of the Legacies and Memory of Slavery at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and author of the critically acclaimed Post-Conflict Memorialisation, Missing Memorials, Absent Bodies. We're also excited to welcome Tomiwa or Tom Owalade, the writer and critic whose proposal for his forthcoming book, This Is Not America, won the Royal Society of Literature Giles St. Auburn Award earlier this year. Thank you, Olivette and Tomiwa, for joining us. Hello. Hello. Hi. I think that it makes sense for us to start at the beginning, as it were. On, on May the 25th, 2020, a 46-year-old African-American man called George Floyd was forcibly restrained by a white police officer causing his death. And this was captured on mobile phone and the subsequent footage circulated widely across the US and the world, evoking a huge public outcry. And it seems to have had continuing reverberations in the political, social and cultural spheres. So, so let's talk about culture. Has the death of George Floyd changed the cultural landscape in any way? O Olivette? Well, I think it has in many ways, uh, because we've seen many institutions issuing statements and, and things like that, and actually looking into uh, the ways in which they address uh, discrimination and uh, inequalities. However, uh, there are uh, many other things that need to be looked at, because this has become a kind of banner to, to hide behind uh, in order not to address uh, everyday racism and microaggression and so on and so forth. So some things have changed, others need to be, you know, looked at more deeply. Tom? Yes, um, I, I would agree with um, what Oliver has just said about um, how the death of George Floyd has transformed many um, institutions and made them more responsive um to arguments about um representation and trying to increase um racial representation um and ethnic representation um but um it's still unclear um what the end goal of all of this is mm, that's interesting I, I wonder whether you think it's had an impact very specifically on on what we're interested in which is non-fiction is that visible in any way should Tom? I go first or Yeah, yeah, Tom. Um Yeah, I think I think it has because the over the past few years um there there's been books on um race but after um Judge Floyd was murdered in America I definitely noticed an uptick in the number of non-fiction books um about racial experience um and I think it's a, a very particular genre of nonfiction um, book, um, which comes from a personal perspective, um, which comes from an angle um, that says, this is my experience of racism. Um, and I think many publishers in particular have sought this kind of book because they want um, more authentic voices which can um, show at a more visceral level the 
experience of racism. Mm -hmm. All of us? Um, I, I agree as well. I think something happened as well, which is perhaps the publishing industry has opened the door wider to publications about children and children, uh, black and brown children's stories, mm. because I've seen an increase in the number of children's books related to uh, to race, personal experience as well. And that, that, is, that is a great thing um, to do. But I also think that they were already... Uh, books around those topics and um, I think this has created a, a an unfortunate but however an, op an opportunity for some for some writers to look into this even those who are not writing about race have have been uh, started to write about their indeed their experience in the UK certainly I've seen that Yes, it's interesting you mentioned children because Mallory Blackman has just been announced as the winner of the Penn Pinter Award. And, and, and of course, her work has been about fiction for children, thinking specifically about race, too. I, I wonder if, if, if this is if it's right to think of the murder of George Floyd and, and, and the, the Black Lives Matters movement that, that has come of it as, as a turning point. Because I wonder if African-Americans and, and Black Britons would say, that George Floyd's story is part of a much longer struggle. So, so is this a is this a turning point, Olivet? Yes, it is because, and I'm speaking as a somebody who's uh, who's in Britain, but also grew up in Paris and who's French. And it was uh, the, the the death while well, the killing of George Floyd resonated very much so in France as well. And it actually opened uh, the door to discussions about uh, police brutality. And, and, and question of, of uh, discrimination as well, not just in France, in Germany, uh, in, in the Netherlands and in many other parts of Europe. So yes, it was a turning point. Tom? Yep, yeah, it, it, was, it was definitely <laughs> a turning point. Um, and, and, I, and I think it was also a turning point, um, not just in terms of trying to um, address discrimination um in 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 the particular country that you are living in um but it, it was also a turning point um in in terms of um raising awareness of history as well um, um so so I, I think there's also been an increase um just thinking about nonfiction books an increase in um trying to understand the historical context that led to mm -hmm. um to to particular forms of racism mm -hmm. and what about the black lives matter movement olivet is this something unprecedented and is there something and and what is it that is distinctive about this particular anti-racism initiative i it's distinctive because it's it happens in a particular context but it's an extension to centuries of, of uh, uh, black radical activism. So it's sitting very well into a longer history. And I think we should see it, look at it that way as well. The specificity is that uh, people thought that after the election of uh, Barack Obama, we were living in so-called post-racial societies. And we all knew, well, many of us knew that it wasn't true. Um, so the movement was born. Um, after that, and the movement, the Black Lives Matter, is is not just about the the state, the U.S., but it really is about uh, Black Lives Mattering in across across the globe, really, particularly in the global north. Mm. So it's specific, but it's also it has a long history. Mm. T Tommy, you've been critical of the way the Black Lives Matter movement has has flattened and and perhaps ignored some specific context. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I've written about, um, and I'm currently writing about in my forthcoming book, um, about the ways in which um, cultural, national, um, and geographical contexts are not taken into account sufficiently enough, um, because although racism, broadly speaking, um, is a global problem, um, it's also qualified by context as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that if you want to show genuine respect and genuine dignity to black people, 
it's worth taking into account that not all black people are the same and -hmm. black people are mediated by the particular context with which they face. Um, um, And I think one of the problems with a lot of contemporary race discourse is that they look at um, the condition of black British people, for example, um, through the perspective of black Americans. Um, And I would argue that black Americans have a very distinctive history which can't necessarily be translated into um, the experience of black people in Britain or black people in um, continental Europe um, Mm. or black people in contemporary Africa. Um, And and therefore we need to adjust for um, different contexts as well. Mm. Are you able to tell me a little bit more about that that difference between the difference you detect between Black Britons and African Americans? Sure. What does um, that? Yes. Yeah. So, for instance, um, in the UK, um, the overwhelming majority of Black people are either immigrants or the children of immigrants, whereas in America, the overwhelming majority of Black people um, are the descendants of imported slaves from Africa Um, and in fact the majority of black people in America can trace their ancestry further back than the average um, white American Uh, whereas in the UK um, it's 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 not the same it's in America um, the history of racism has very much been about um segregation um jim crow laws um and the subsequent racial terrors that follow from that whereas in the uk the, the, the kind of racism that's been experienced by black people has been continuous with the um the sort of racism experienced by other immigrant groups as well um and i think another um factor that should be taken into account is that um in America, for instance, um, the black population um, constitute about 13 or 12 percent of the population, um, whereas in the UK it's about 3 percent. And if you contrast the black population in America um, with the Asian population in America, um, the black population is twice as large. Whereas if you look at the UK, um, it's, it's, it's in reverse. Um, so, so the Asian population in the UK is um, twice as large as the black population in the UK. And I think all, all of these factors um, should be taken into account because I think if you genuinely care about social justice, you should also um, be specific in your focus and be specific in what you mean by black people rather than just assuming that um, all our experiences are the same. Oliver, what, what do you think? Because your book, African Europeans, which came out in 2020, was also trying to draw out a, a, a distinctive context. So, so what do you think about Tom's that sense that, 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 that black experience is distinctive and specific to context? It is distinctive uh, indeed. And, um, and I thank him for providing these information. I would also say that there is such a thing as black internationalism, which looks more at the uh, point of connections uh, within the broader fight for discrimination, specifically in the global north, but not, but not exclusively. And I'm thinking about African-Americans traveling in the 19th century, traveling to London and trying to find allies and finding allies, actually. I'm thinking about them in the 20th century going to Paris and to North Africa to try and and connect because there is a lived experience of oppression, colonialism and so on and so forth. So they're not mutually exclusive. I think they work Mm. together, the context Mm. and the general. It's always interesting to to hear you talk about the long history of of Black experience. And I I wonder, before Black Lives Matter, who were the key writers? What were the key texts of race do you think what who, who were you reading what was important to you o- olivette um oh i started you know to to look at race i, I looked at shikanta job um 
who who wrote about um the uh, black origins of egypt um so there was color the the the, the melanin point here because we were raised to believe that um the egyptologists were white and they were french and they they discover everything so he was basically trying to prove that you know they were uh, um, pharaohs who, who had dark skin and by the way some 50 years now um, I'm 52 so uh, some 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 decades now there will be an exhibition this this month at the Louvre looking at mm. black pharaohs and that an extraordinary moment because somebody wrote about them some some years ago so there was you know she can't tell you but there are many others Anna Julia Cooper they were um, the uh, uh, the Nardal sister, I, I actually cite a lot of them uh, mm -hmm. in, in my book, African European. So there's a long history. And that is, for me, it's important to look at that because it's a it's a history uh, in practice, meaning the tools to, to fight against discrimination, but also to look at creative ways to uh, um, for, for people of, of African descent, people uh, of Caribbean descent to create their own spaces of, of creativity and, and knowledge and transmit those knowledge. So it's not just about racism and discrimination. It's also about, as I said, creativity and uh, powerful, powerful places of resilience. Mm -hmm. mm. Tom? Um, in, in terms of um, any, any time period? Yeah, I, I'm just thinking. It's just important, I think, as Olivetta is saying, to to not think that the 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 thinking and writing about race has just happened right now. There's a a long history. So so I'm just interested to know, you know, who was important for you to read to 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 think about race. Um, well, I I think the greatest um, American essayist of the 20th century, irrespective of race and color, um, was James Baldwin. Of course, yes. Um, and I, and I think that um, I even prefer Baldwin's essays to his fiction work. Um, um, I admire the elegance of his prose style um, and the intensity of his moral convictions. Um, and I think that he, more than anyone else in the mid 20th century, bore witness to the racial reckoning that um, needed to happen in the United States. Um, and I think one um, underemphasized aspect of Baldwin's work um, and of Baldwin's worldview was his, was his insistence on the fact that he was an American. Mm -hmm. um, so even though um, he spent large parts of his life living in France um, and also in Turkey, he always felt like an American in exile. And he always emphasized his Americanness, um, which, which I think is something that is both um, as a matter of fact and also as a matter of ideology. Um, so I think it's a, it's a matter of fact because um, the inspiration, both intellectually and ideologically, for um, his moral vision comes from a very particularly uh, African American um, religious sensibility, mm. which you notice in the cadences of his prose. Um, and I think it's also. Um, a matter of fact, because uh, I don't think you can divorce um, Baldwin's work from the context of somebody that grew up in America at that particular time. Um, so in, in one of his essays, Baldwin recounts how um, after the Second World War, many of the white demobbed um, American soldiers um came to france um and, and and in that essay baldwin emphasized that um these white americans um were just as much strangers to france as he was mm. 
even though, um, of course, these, these white Americans had European ancestry, um, which um, Baldwin definitely had less of. Um, nevertheless, they, they, they both came from the same place. Um, and, and, and I think that um, one important element of anti-racism is emphasizing, is, is trying to cut down the distinctions um, that um, racists, of course, used to make. But um, I, I sometimes feel that many um, anti-racists make by mistake, which is to um, to sort of set up an opposition between being Western, being black. Um, right. Baldwin was very much Westernized. Um, and, and I think that any form of anti-racism needs to show just how contingent and how culturally flexible terms like being Western is. Mm. That's so interesting and helpful to hear, Olivetta and, and Tom. Um, I, I wonder about about right now, except exempting your own excellent work, <laughs> where who is writing in the most illuminating and provocative ways about race and blackness right now where are these conversations happening uh, uh, uh tom perhaps you could go first do you mean from a, a a uk perspective or from an american perspective from either actually whichever you think is is most illuminating and provocative um most most provocative at the moment i think um from from recent years definitely is an american writer called thomas chatterton williams um, so Thomas Chatton Williams um, grew up in New Jersey, but currently resides in um, in France at the moment. Um, and um, Chatton Williams um, basically argues that race um, is a fiction, mm-hmm. and that we um, cling on too tightly to race to make sense of the world and to make sense of ourselves. Um, and he also argues that the ultimate endpoint of anti-racism should be to try to, dis- to discard um, the, um, our, our obsessions with race um, and our reliance upon race. Um, and... Um, I don't necessarily agree with um, all of his viewpoints, but thinking in terms of being provocative and being stimulating, mm-hmm. um, I would definitely put him up there. Yeah, that is provocative, isn't it? It's sort of counter to lots of the current impulses to yeah. to to ratify identity or confirm yeah. identity in some ways and its distinctiveness. Oliver, who who are you reading? Who are you finding provocative or illuminating? I don't want to give you uh, titles because there are quite a few of them. Uh, what I find most interesting right now is, is well, there's the reading, but there's also the doing, which mm-hmm. is for me what's happening in many various communities and uh, various activists and organisation, which are well, not the not the offspring, uh, offsprings of Black Lives Matter, but institutions and organisation that were there on the ground and that and that took things into uh, the next level and these are these are community organizations in in Bristol in London uh, Cardiff Newport and that are fighting for uh, of course social racial gender justice but also looking at um, class as well and looking at, at questions like uh, uh, um, food poverty and things like that so I, I think um, I'm a reader, I'm an avid reader, but I think that sometimes, at least for me, I need to to disconnect just from the discourse and the pages and the words to look at the, what is in practice, what is put into practice. Yes. D- does that mean that you think that sometimes the, the writing, the, the slew of op-eds, for instance, as, as well as the non-fiction writing and the essays about race, are, are perhaps not not equal to the practice of of, of people uh, 
or who are activists or working in communities that there's a disconnect perhaps between what writing can do and the kind of analysis that happens in in literary writing and and what's happening in reality not necessarily i see the 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 fight against racism as multidimensional there's the writing mm-hmm. there's the practice there's the creativity there's the coming together with both with means to um to to end well to try and end this so i don't see them as opposing each other but uh, in constant dialogue challenging each other really right yeah that's really helpful to hear i think Sh- should we talk about publishing for a moment um publishing like like many industries has has also had to take the death of the murder of george floyd and the the black lives matter movement as a moment of reckoning uh, and an opportunity to 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 perhaps to perhaps put its own house in order. To what extent do you think that unconscious bias has played a part in the kind of commissioning decisions that publishers have made over the last decade or so? Is that something that you're aware of or alert to, T- Tom? Um, I, I with something like unconscious bias. Um, I think it's very difficult to speak definitively about yeah. because by its very nature, it's unconscious. Yes. <laughs> so you can't, you can't speak with any sure confidence about it. Um, in, in recent years, um, as, as I said at the start of this conversation, yeah, I, I think there has definitely been um, an uptick in mm-hmm. um, a particular sort of book about racial experience which has a very particular memoiristic personal dimension to it um and with publicity in particular in publishing um there's been a lot of um but i guess this is true in general there's been a lot of if you enjoy this book about race then you definitely enjoy this forthcoming book about race um which which I'm slightly skeptical of and slightly wary of because I think that um, a, a lot of these books, at least in the way that they are presented, um, imply that there is there, that there is a homogenous um, perspective on race, that 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 there's no sort of um, diversity of opinion that there isn't any conflicts or any um conversation that it's simply a consensus when it comes to um racial experience which i don't think it's true and which i think that the publishing industry has a responsibility to reflect um and i, I don't think it's doing enough to reflect that mm-hmm. Olivet. um I just, I just, I'm just thinking about uh, this idea of unconscious bias, and, and and I'm a, I'm a teacher, and I think it's to do with education and the positioning of what, whose education and whose whose history matters, um, again, and and therefore how we look at so-called minority stories, and I would say that they've they've been a lot of efforts made in the publishing industry, as far as I know, but I also see a backlash as in who gets to tell the story, you know, you, you've heard of that discussion about why mm-hmm. can't I, a white male, uh, write mm. about a black woman and so on mm. and so forth. And I find it quite interesting that that discussion in that backlash and I find it really revealing and symptomatic of something deeper, which is anxiety about one's place in society and, and mm. the loss of power, really. Mm. What about for, for for the two of you? Is is I wonder if... If race is restrictive sometimes, are, are writers of colour obliged to write about race? I, I wonder if you feel that pre- I, I understand, of course, that that may be what you want to do. And in fact, you do it brilliantly. But also, is there a, a sense of obligation or responsibility or even pressure to, to, to write about race? Olivet? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I do feel that there are a lot... Um, there is a lot at stake, and again, it's, it's to do with personal journeys and, and context. There are two things I would say as far as that is concerned, is that 
um, personally, I, I moved from uh, doing a PhD on, on Welsh poetry, which is mainly white, mm-hmm. um, to doing history of slavery and colonialism because of not pressure, but the urge to do that. So there was right. a duty on my side. But I would also say that there's there's something else, which is we react differently to discrimination and to, to, to the weight of our history. So it could be through writing, but not necessarily about race, you know. There are many mm-hmm. things doing incredibly, people, uh, black people, doing incredible things that have nothing to do necessarily with, with race. And I think they should be allowed to. So the, this, this idea of duty it really makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm, yes. I look forward to your, your book on ballroom dancing, Olivet, or something something d- entirely different. Um, <laughs> Tom, what do you think? Is, 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 do you feel pressure or an obligation or pressure to write about race? My interest in this um, particular subject, um, I think, comes more from interest than pressure or obligation. Um, but I also do think that... Um, Nobody should be obliged to write about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I I dislike the connection between obligation and writing. Um, I think writing should stem from volition, um, and any sort of writing which comes from a sense of obligation feels to me formulaic and stale, um, and lacking any sense of vitality mm-hmm. um so so i i, I do think that um and, and i think yeah and, and i do think that black writers in particular shouldn't be um put in a pigeonhole they should be allowed to write about anything that they want to write about um mm-hmm. in, in fact i think it's essential that um that black writers be uh, encouraged to um, not simply um, confine themselves to one particular subject, because um, because e- e- even even at a more practical level, um, there are times when, um, to be quite frank, the um, issues of race are not um, that newsworthy, uh, and, and in those circumstances, what can black writers do if if all that they focus on is something which is contingent upon um the news um i i and, and i think but it's it's not just the case of it's not just down to black writers it's down to uh, editors at newspapers and magazines it's down to um publishers um and editors at publishing companies they need to be more responsive as well to black writers that want to write about things apart from race as well. Yes, I, I was going to ask you both about this, that, that that part of that work must happen with edi- editors, with agents, with publishers, with commissioners. Um, and, and, and I wonder what your experience is. Are you seeing their mindsets changing about the kinds of work that, that writers of colour can produce, not just uh, uh, on race on all sorts of subjects but also shifting the conversation on race so that we're able to to present different arguments new perspectives what's your experience of that of, of working with publishers agents commissioners editors the the gatekeepers is, is that relationship changing tom perhaps um it's 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 difficult to know if it's changing or not because um I've only been in the um I've only been writing um seriously for about two years. Um and I'm currently writing my first book. Um so I have nothing to um judge it against from the past. Mm-hmm. Um so it's it's difficult to me to to know if it's changed, but um from the outside it seems like it's changed. Um and um uh it, it seems like it's changed, um, but I, I don't know where this um, where this change is going to lead to. Mm-hmm. If it's going to lead to more um, a, a sort of consensus um, in terms of the type types of books that are being published, or if it's going to lead to genuine diversity, 
Mm-hmm. Because, because of course, when we think of diversity, we tend to think of diversity in terms of representation, um, in, in terms of the racial or ethnic representation on offer. Um, but I also think um, when we think of diversity, we should also think of diversity of opinion as well. Um, pluralism, I think, is a very important value. Um, and I think it should be the responsibility of publishing companies to reflect the fact that not all black people agree uh, on certain sensitive issues, not all white people, of course, as well, agree on sensitive issues, and that they should try as much as they can to publish a wide variety of views um, and to um, offer the reader the opportunity to make up their own minds on the basis of this diversity of views. Yes, I I want to ask you the same question, Olivet, but also to recognise your background as an academic, because universities like publishing is uh, publishing is is an institution and I wonder if you think that these are two institutions that are relying on individuals like you or me or, or Tom to to solve or provide answers to systemic problems rather than addressing it themselves yes I think they're relying on individuals but I would like to to come back to two things which is that I actually um, published two trade books and one academic one and and we moved from, no, you can't write about race. Um, actually, you're not the best person. I'm talking from personal experience here. You're not the best person to do a PhD on slavery to uh, please do things about slavery and write about <laughs> colonialism. <laughs> and we, we, we're opening doors for you to do that. In fact, if there aren't many of you who are expert, we're going to ask black people, even if they're not expert, to write on this because, well, this is a good time. And I think it taps into something that, um, I think it's Cedric um, Robinson who wrote about racial capitalism, which is really uh, extracting economic or social values to to, to from from people and and using a moment in time, uh, usually people uh, of color, using a moment in time to to turn certain event into a business. So I think there are two sides to to this. I'm happy the doors are opening, but sometimes they feel a bit uh, extractive or exploitative. Yeah, there's a lot of work still to do, isn't there? Um, Thank you both so much. We have one last question because on this podcast, we love to get reading recommendations. You've both already made excellent suggestions. Diop, Baldwin, Chatterton Williams. But I wanted to give you a chance to recommend a non-fiction book on any subject that has made a big impact on you and that you might like our readers to go away and spend time with. O- can, can Olivet go first, please? <laughs> yeah. My it's so hard. It's the, going blank, it's the, but it's gonna... the worst question to ask people who read. What What would you like to recommend to read? But oh Olivet, my... I'm going to put the pressure on you. Oh my goodness! So, um, okay. So, oh, m- maybe it's it's a classic. These are classics for me. So, White Innocence by Gloria Wecker, um, or Anna Julia Cooper, Voice from the South. Um, and so many others, really. But I'm going to choose those, these two women. That's a start. Thank you. And Tom? Um, I, I think one of the, the best books that I've read in recent years, um, non-fiction-wise anyway, is um, The Free World by an American writer called Louis Menon. Um, and it's about the period between... 1945 to 1970 in American um, culture. Um, um, So Menon, who writes for The New Yorker, explores different intellectuals um, and how all of them responded to um, the Cold War. So he looks at Baldwin, um, Susan Sontag, Lionel Trillin, um, the influence of French cinema on American cinema, um, the Beatles as well. Um, so it's 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 just a very long and stimulating um, look at cultural politics in mid twentieth century America, and it's um, yeah, I really loved it. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tomiwa and Olivette, for a really valuable conversation, I think. We'd also like to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous support of this podcast. The winner of the 2022 Bailey Gifford Prize will be announced on the 17th of November. If you'd like to know more about the prize, you can visit our website or follow us on Twitter at BG Prize. Do join us next time to hear more about non-fiction writing. Goodbye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.